Hey everyone, so we are on to our next standard for U.S. history. This is going to be dealing with challenges with industrialization and urbanization. So the 1.3 uh, students will analyze the casual relationship between industrialization and the challenges faced by growing working class in the urban setting. So the central question I have for you to work with is simply from the standard, what challenges people uh, were people presented with as the United States industrialized and urbanized? So some simple context, we've been talking about second industrialization for a while, and the, when we industrialize more so as a country, it changes the way we are in so many ways. Some of the things we'll talk about a little bit today as well. Um, cities become more and more crowded as a result of immigrants moving there, as well as people from the rural areas, because that's where jobs are available to them. And uh, the availability of jobs, as well as some of the attractions to city life, help kind of create more and more um, populated cities in our country and more dense population density as well. And so with the population increasing, as well as, um, you know, the disparity between wealth, we start to see a formulation of a new social class, which is known as the working class people. Um, and so that's something that we're going to focus on, some of the challenges that are facing the working class people um, in these, these cities as they industrialize and urbanize. So one of the major cha changes that happen in you know industrialization is that the family life changes a lot of ways. So family sizes decreased from seven children in 1800 to 3.6 children in 1900. And of course, this is an average. This is not like a 0.6 of a kid is going to be you know born at that time. But the seven uh, children average of the 1800s was commonly because of you know the the life that people are living in the 1800s is more rural and more farmers and so you know it's not uncommon for people to have large families and lots of children marry younger ages than they would be in the the end of the century and so um you know the, the large families was a very common practice and such but by 1900 you know more people urbanizing and, and, and because of industrialization this changes the way people live. So, you know, rather than getting married at teenagers, you know, people are getting married later in life in their 20s and 30s, um, even later in some cases. Um, and so because women don't have as long of a period to have children um, because they're marrying later, you have less children for that reason. On top of that, living in the cities is expensive. It's crowded. And so having more children creates more of a financial burden on families in a way that uh, has them evaluate whether or not to practice certain family planning practices to have less children. And so that is something that occurs as a result of that. Um, and so, you know, the other thing with the family and the changes in the family is that because of industrialization, especially in urbanization, it's, like I said, it's very expensive to live in the um, cities. So everyone's got to pull their weight. And so it's not like uncommon for like, you know, the, the, the parents to be working separate jobs as well as children working in jobs as well. And so the family unit it would be, um, you know, less strong uh, during this time unit time period um, because they're spending so much time apart from each other. Um, you know, trying to, to make ends meet. And so that's something of a, a chain, challenge it to the you know, status quo, as it were, um, as a result of industrialization and urbanization. There is a higher standard of living overall um, for many people in America and such. You know, this time period is kind of known as the American Renaissance. There's more art, more literature. You know, example of uh, a famous author that you still read his work in, in schools today is Mark Twain. So the author of Huckleberry Finn, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, you know, many other like stories and, and writings of Mark Twain. Um, you know, we start to, as a country, get, become more recognized for the contributions to art and literature, um, trying to, to keep pace with um, Europe, who had a much larger head start than we did. Public education is also something that you see major changes in as a result of, of urbanization, industrialization. You know, in 1870, um, you know, half of children had no formal education. Um, but by 1890, you know, there was higher demands for cities to start providing public education services and schools so that people could send their kids to school and then also prepare them for work life. And much of the, the, the public school system of that time and even today reflects kind of that industrial economy. And think about what is the thing that makes our classes, you know, begin and end. Well, like the signal where you're supposed to go where to when. 
it's the bell. And it's not that different from a factory where the factory, the bell or the, the steam um, horn, uh, you know, roars. And that marks the beginning of the of the workday and then one marks the end of the workday. And so this is kind of helping socialize them to prepare to work in an industrial economy. And that's what the purpose of public schools were. Liberal arts education is happening, but not as much as a frequency as is today. And when I mean liberal arts education, I'm talking about science, I'm talking about history, English, math. Those are your kind of your general liberal arts. Um, and so there's less of those, but more vocational jobs, um, you know, vocational education, teaching kids to uh, art, artisan craft or skill of some kind that would fit into the industrial workplace. Leisure, there's lots of sports and entertainment available in the city um, and then outside the city as well. Um, so the bicycle is uh, something that becomes very popular during this era, um, a kind of reflection of, you know, changing technology. And so people would get their bikes and they'd ride them through the cities or um, take them out in the country, ride them in the country. And so this is a leisurely activity that more and more people are picking up during this time and era. Um, not to mention that because people live in the cities, they go to the rural parts to escape kind of the, the chaos of the city itself. And so like the idea of taking a leisurely activity to go outside, go camping, go um, hiking, whatever it was, this is something that starts to become more popular. And you didn't see this before because people typically lived in the, the rural parts. So they didn't feel like they were months nature more so than when cities and so people are like, it's like an activity, a, a trip to go outside the city and visit nature once again. Sports becomes more popular during this time. Baseball, of course, is, is the, the big one and, and um, not the biggest, but one of the big ones. Uh, boxing, in fact, was the most popular sport of this era. Um, and people would sit by their radios later in the 1920s and such, and they would listen to the, um, the boxing matches as they were. So um, those are big sports and such. Baseball itself becoming more and more popular. There were two major professional leagues in the country uh, in the late 1800s, uh, the National League and the American League. Eventually they kind of formed to become what becomes Major League Baseball. Um, this one, this um, team right up here, this is the Chicago White Sox. Uh, I can't remember which year it is. But they're more famous to be known as the Black Sox because uh, – they were uh, paid by gamblers to throw the World Series and uh, um, lose on purpose so that gamblers could make lots of money and such. Um, it was found out. Um, they, many of them were thrown out of baseball forever uh, as a result of that, including one who I think is a Hall of Famer. If he's not, he should be. It's a guy named Sho Shoeless Joe Jackson. Um, and so, yeah. I'm rambling about baseball. I probably shouldn't. Football becomes a, a very popular sport in the college ranks. It hasn't quite made a professional um, uh, league yet, but in the college ranks, it ranks it becomes very popular. So teams like Army, Navy, Notre Dame, Michigan, Yale, they're all the powerhouses of that era um, of, of college football. And this is like before helmets too. So um, it was definitely a tough sport to play. Entertainment, you had the vaudeville shows. These are the um, these very cheap theaters. We would pay a dime to get in, and then you would be able to like have an evening of like 10 little skits. That you have a comedian come out. You have someone doing juggling. You have someone doing a, a play from um, uh, Hamlet or you know some, some sort of scene from Shakespeare and just kind of a wide variety show that was available. Um, these shows, you know, definitely like uh, promoted a lot of stereotypes about immigrants and African Americans. Um, they, you know, became famous. They also did the whole blackface thing, um, where that started off was when these shows. Um, but you know, during that time, that was kind of where the entertainment lied, right? And of course, the greatest show on earth, the circus. Uh, P.T. Barnum and James Bailey's, uh, you know, greatest show on earth circus, the Three Wing Circus. Um, where they had exotic animals, you had um, lots of, um, you know, performances like the high flying trapeze and such. It truly was like the greatest show on earth. And the fact that they would load up their show onto the trains and travel different parts of the country, set up these giant tents, and then perform for people all across the country. Um, it, it was it was certainly a sight to see. Now it's like eh, a big deal, but back then it was truly the greatest show on earth. So. 
the tenement housing. Okay, so we're kind of switching gears a little bit, and we're talking about some more of the challenging things that came with urbanization and city lives. So because you have this flood of immigrants that are flying into the cities as, well, sailing into the cities, really, um, at a pace that was unsustainable for many of the cities to continue to be able to provide housing and other essential services for the, the new uh, arrivals, you know, we end up seeing the um, building of these poorly constructed, uh, poorly ventilated and, and you know, housing that cut corners on materials and, and safety uh, regulation, safety um, stuff. And so they put these houses up very quickly and uh, they, they just get filled so, so quick and so densely that it creates ultimately lots of problems in these slums where these tenement houses were being built. And so, you know, overcrowding led to a lot of unsanitary issues. You know, the, the, the ventilation that did exist oftentimes was stuffed with either garbage or, or people looking for extra storage space. Um, and so you have very stagnant air that's kind of making up in this. Um, it spreads infectious diseases like cholera, yellow fever, tuberculosis, like nobody's business, you know. And so to give you a kind of a stat that shows you how unsafe these conditions were, about 25 percent, one in four of the babies born in this, uh, you know, part of the city in the late 1800s died before reaching the age one. Um, and so that, you know, gives you an understanding of how terrible the conditions were, uh, the tenement houses as people lived in. The cities itself were also extremely dirty, and it's not just the tenement housings and such. The cities as a whole, and especially in these slum areas, were really bad. And it's because, like again, when they're putting up these these houses and they're doing so quickly, they're not putting proper uh, plumbing in. They're not connected to the sewers because the sewers can't reach out to them fast enough. Um, and so people would take put their trash into the street. Um, they would dump it into the riverways. Um, you know, this, these were common practices because they really had no other option as far as getting rid of some of this waste. Um, you know, the, there were private cesspools that, uh, were created between houses and such where people, so like, if you don't know what a cesspool is, you can thank your lucky stars that you don't because you live in an era where plumbing is much more widely available. Um, but people, if they need to make their business, they would go into these pots and then they would take them and dump them out into the cesspool, um, you know, or into the streets themselves. And so you'd have like, you know, fecal matter and other, you know, things that are making up these cesspools. Those cesspools, anytime it would rain, um, would flood over and then just kind of pour into the streets, into people's houses and so forth. I mean, just the most disgusting things you can think of, um, you know, how these dirty these cities were. Um, you can see in this picture here, this dead horse and such. Yes, you know, animal dies in the street. There's no way of removing it. So it becomes part of the, like the trash pile um, that, that makes up that uh, area and such. Horses, you know, because they were more commonly used than, than cars this time, because cars were not been, uh, you know, modernized to, to make for the common man in these early cities. People still wore, uh, you know, rode their horses. So horses, you know, if you've ever been to a parade, you will see the horses. They make their business on the street. It sits there unless someone comes and cleans it up. And so you have piles of, you know, animal um, feces that are kind of making up the line in the streets and gutters of, of the um, streets of, uh, of Chicago, New York, um, Philadelphia, all over, right? Um, one person, George Waring, who I want to bring attention to because no one here, I'm sure, has ever heard of him, but he plays a significant role in American history because he gets elected to the New York Department of Street Cleaning. He was a former military guy, and so he ran it like a military organization. And all of his uh, employees wear these white uh, uniforms, pristine white uniforms, you know, shiny brass buttons and everything. They look like a military service. Um, but their job was to go and clean the streets. And so every day, the white wings, as they become known as, would go out and they would sweep up the streets of trash, you know, put it onto carts and carry it outside city limits to put into a dump. And so, you know, this kind of paves the way for the modern city of having in sanitation departments, you know, to where we don't have to like pile our garbage in our backyards or our front yards or wherever we can, our neighbor's yards, wherever you want to put that garbage. Um, you know, we have like 
yeah. every city, every municipality in the country has some way of removing waste, either as sewer systems or garbage systems. That is in large part to kind of what he paves forward. And so, you know, New York City Department of Street and Cleaning eventually becomes kind of the um, sanitation department that spreads to all the cities. So this allows city life to become much cleaner, more safe. But in the early days of industrialization, urbanization, these were real issues that they were dealing with. On top of that, crime was a major issue. And so crime, you know, led to poverty, or crime not led to poverty, poverty itself, and in sort of population density and influx of people and such, it, all the recipes that, that you need to, to lead to an increase of crime. Um, games would form in neighborhoods, especially ethnic neighborhoods, because they felt like they had to protect their neighborhood from outside forces. So like you had Italian gains and Irish gains fighting in the streets for, you know, issues over a corner that they, they kind of overlapped a little bit, you know. And so these are things that did happen. Um, you know, theft was rampant, gambling big time because it was unregulated and so forth. Um, and it wasn't illegal per se, maybe frowned upon. Um, but gambling deals with or it leads to a lot of social issues itself. Prostitution was widespread in, in the cities. They had parts of the city called the red light districts where prostitution um, was rampant and so forth. And this is a, an issue that still exists in cities today. Um, but um, back then it was extremely bad. Uh, and prostitution leads to a lot of other problems as well, which I don't need to get into. City staffs, uh, city police forces were extremely underpaid, understaffed, overworked, a lot of times underqualified. And so, you know, they were trying to play catch up with, against uh, these criminal enterprises and they were going on inside the cities. Um, and so because of that and other factors and such, you know, you still saw a lot of crime in these cities uh, and it would be the case for a very long time. Even today, you know, any city deals with an enormous amount of crime, um, some more than others. Probably one of the biggest issues um, that faced uh, the working class at this time was the uh, prevalence for alcohol abuse. So alcohol was really, really like the only substance, um, you know, where people would, could potentially abuse. Um, they didn't have drugs like they did. I mean, they did, but they weren't like a substance abuse thing. Alcohol was something that people used for escapism uh, in the very difficult lives that they were living. So, you know, imagine yourself being a factory worker working a 14, 15, 16 hour shift. Um, your body hurts, you know, you are exhausted. Um, you, you know, you know, all you have to do is go home, get up and go do it all over again. So people oftentimes are looking for something to kind of escape that, that numbness of, of the, the industrial life. And so many turn to alcohol as a way to do it, where alcohol was, has been used for Lots of times, it, the abuse of alcohol happens way more so because people are drinking more to try to numb themselves and escape more, um, similar to how people abuse drugs today. And I would say the alcohol abuse that was going on back then it was a national problem, similar to what we see with the opioid crisis in America today. Um, and it leads to a lot of problems. So as a result of alcoholism um, rising and during this time, you see a fueling of more domestic issues such as vandalism, theft, and of course, the worst of the worst, domestic abuse. And, you know, when husbands would go and work all day and then they get off, they take their paycheck right to the liquor store or right to a bar or saloon and they would drink half of it away come home, the wife rightfully angry, upset that the money they need to pay for the rent and feed their children and so forth, calls them out on that. And because he's drunk and because alcohol kind of you know, makes people stupid, let's just say in a scientific term, um, they, you know, would then beat their wives. And so um, domestic abuse was a major issue that kind of links in with the alcohol abuse issue. So I mention this now because when we get into later parts of our history, there will be reform movements to try to curb um, the abuse of alcohol. And even for a short period in our history, we ban alcohol in the United States because of the problems that it was creating. And so even though alcohol is still an issue today, it's not nearly the same level of problem that it was back then um, and during this time period. 
The other thing is the working conditions were pretty terrible for the working class people as well. There's absolutely no regulations. If you all recall, when we talked about in 1.4, the um, you know American government was essentially a laissez-faire policy, hands off, let the businesses do whatever they want. So then what that leads to is a problem with the um, lack of regulation and safety uh, protocols that are put in place. There are perpetual amounts of um, uh, worker accidents that happen as a result of that. So, you know, some examples, white lung and black lung, these are two very terrible diseases that came about with industrialization. White lung is something that exists primarily in textile factories. And so we're working with cotton and as they're kind of making this clothing, every time they stitch and such, you know, kind of throws this, this white dust into the air. And so if you're sitting there for 12 hours a day breathing this stuff in, you know, eventually it kind of accumulates on your lungs to where it's going to create health problems for you, which it did. Um, black lung is something that is uh, prevalent in coal miners because coal miners, as they're working in these conditions, you know, as they're chopping away at the, the coal to like break off to where they can send it back to the surface and send it off to a train. Every time they hit the hammers or their axes or whatever it is that they're using to, to separate that, it's kicking up black dust in the air that they breathe in and they don't have masks, you know, they don't have proper safety equipment and such. So every time they breathe that in, you know, it's kind of accumulating on their lungs, which will eventually lead to cancer and death, early death or other health problems that occur with it. Heart conditions, uh, you know, common with it as well. My grandfather was a coal miner for half of his life and um, or half of his working life, I should say. And even though he is the mines closed down, um, you know, after he came home from World War II, uh, he still was it dealt with like it conditions, health conditions that link back to when he was working in a coal mine um, with uh, conditions that were with safety regulations that were less than ideal. Right. Um, child labor was legal. We'll talk more about that uh, later and such. No fire safety regulations, you know, like now if there's a fire, any public building, you have a sprinkler system that's there to kind of stop it. So back then there's really nothing. Um, and that's something we'll talk more about um, or you'll see more about when uh, you do the triangle shirtwaist fire um, assignment uh, that's attached to this. And then the injuries, um, Results typically in term, termination, no compensation whatsoever. Today, if you get injured on the job, you know, you get workers' compensation. It's it's to help pay for your medical costs from that injury that you occurred on the job. Um, so there are there's things like that. At the same time, um, you know, like if you're working in a sewing factory and you, you know, after a 12-hour shift and it's the end of it and you're not paying attention, you kind of put your hand – through the sewing machine, whatever and such, and that's going to cause some real damage, um, you know, rather than give you work compensation or, you know, like medical benefits, whatever, or something like that, or, you know, paying them during the time that they are recovering, whatever, simply you're fired, bring somebody else in because they, the businesses could, you know, there's no one telling them that they can't do this. And at the same time, like there's always like immigrants, new immigrants coming to the country or people coming from the rural parts of the country that will fill that job very simply. So if it's no like no consideration for the workers whatsoever as far as the pain and suffering they're going to deal with. Um, and so if you get injured on the job, you're on your own. And that was a real kind of the survival of the fittest at its, at its worst um, during this time period. So last time to talk about the essential question, what challenges were people presented with in the United States uh, as the United States industrialized and urbanized? So make sure you put your responses uh, and submit them through Canvas. There is an assignment that's connected to this um, that uh, I will have time to work on it today and in, uh, next class period um, as far as um, you know, allocation of time to be able to work on that. So if you don't finish it all today, that's okay. Um, you'll have some time on either Thursday or Friday to, to finish it up. So that's it from uh, Mr. Henry's classroom. Uh, I hope everyone is home safe and healthy, and I will see you later.